It's a huge factor for your own perception of reality, meeting a different being. The whole planet deserves to know the truth. You may be one of the few people who might be able to help us understand. Species are brought together on a table and have diplomatic conversations. This is with happening. Each other. This is happening. Where? Give an example. I what do, happened I with do. you? This great being enters the room. It's a strong, crisp frequency that your body reacts to. It's happening. It's happening behind the scenes. I mean, Tim. What is the true history of Earth? Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. You know, we have some exciting programs on this show, but wait till you hear what's coming up with Dr. Michael Sala. His latest book is called U.S. Army Insider Missions. We'll tell you about what's going on next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Dr. Michael Sala back with us. His latest book is called U.S. Army Insider Missions. Incredible story. Dr. Sala is a pioneer in the development of exopolitics. He's the author of a number of books, including Kennedy's Last Stand, Galactic Diplomacy, and the one I've just mentioned, U.S. Army Insider Missions. Dr. Sala was an assistant professor of research residence in the School of the International Service at the American University. He has a Ph.D. in government from the University of Queensland in Australia. He is also the founder of the Exopolitics Institute, more recently author of Space Force, our Star Trek future, and that was his number of books in the secret space programs. The U.S. Army Insider Missions makes it what? Which, what number is this one now, Michael? Hi, George. It's, uh, it's number eight in the series. Good for you. It's an incredible book, and you have an insider that you have coined the phrase JP, and we'll uh, find out why you just call him JP. Of course, he doesn't want his name disclosed, does he? Well, that's right. We use it as a pseudonym just to hide his identity. Uh, you know, I've, I've known him since 2008, uh, uh, first as a civilian, and then he joined the Army in 2019, and uh, he continued to share with me uh, things that he saw or that he participated in, and we just decided that it would be best to hide his identity uh, because uh, you know, clearly he would get in trouble with his superiors if uh, his name was uh, released publicly. Folks, Michael has sent us uh, several pictures that we have on coasttocoastam.com under Michael's name. You'll be able to see it where it says related photos right under the uh, stories for tonight. Michael, who came to who first? Did you find JP or did JP find you? Uh, he came to me first in uh, 2008. I just got a phone call from him, and uh, he had just returned from Brazil, and he told me about a contact experience he had. And so that's when we first began communicating, and uh, over the years he would just phone me uh, and tell me about the latest thing that he experienced. But what became clear to me was that this was someone who did have some kind of contact experience with uh, human-looking extraterrestrials that he just called them Nordics at the time. And because of that, he began having these uh, experiences. I mean, he's, his abilities change. That's one of the things that many who have had contact or abductions with uh, extraterrestrials, they report about these new abilities that they have. So one of the abilities that, that he experience was that he began having these ideas of inventions and so he would conceive of a of an invention whether it was a healing invention some kind of free energy invention mm -hmm. and he would build it and so 
then people would start approaching him or he would approach a, a scientist and say, well, I, I've come up with an idea and, and, and what do you think of this? So th his ability began to manifest in him putting together these devices and you know, that brought him to the attention of those within the uh, covert intelligence world who said, well, who is this uh, guy who's uh, coming up with these inventions and why is he kind of like contacting all these people and, and did he really have experiences? And so that's when he began having contacts with uh, people within the covert military who began communicating with him and encouraging him to uh, work with them in terms of developing these uh, inventions. And so that's the way it be began, um, kind of like in the early years after we first started contact. How many years have you been in touch with him? I've been in touch with him for 15 years. Wow. And uh, I've, I've met him several times. I've met his family. I've, uh, you know, I've gone to uh, the military base where he works. And uh, I've, you know, and I've seen all his documentation. So I mean, he's he's the real deal. Uh, he is someone uh, that uh, is genuine. I mean, everything he says to me is based on his first-hand experiences. And so I've just uh, kept a record of our conversations, and I've put it all together in this new book. And I think uh, you know what really struck me when I put together this new book was that uh, the, the the sum is so much greater than the parts that make up his story. I mean, when you put it all together and you see what has happened in terms of the evolution of his contacts with extraterrestrials and with the military intelligence community, it's quite an amazing story. And uh, he is able to talk, I mean, which is... An, Another amazing thing about him is that he he can talk about these things uh, without getting into trouble with his uh, superiors, and in fact, he's being encouraged to talk by members of the covert military. Is he still active military? He is. So you know that's what makes it very sensitive. Uh, he is currently serving um, at a major military base. So I, I I can't say much more than that. Uh, and so he has to be very careful as to what he uh, divulges, uh, and you know we, we just we're just waiting to see how this um, you know new whistleblower protection law uh, plays out because uh, he has already been asked by one of uh, his superior officers um, in the covert military whether he'd like to be part of that program, you know go before the all the uh, all the main anomaly resolution office as a whistleblower to to share or, or to go to Congress uh, to share what he's seen. So uh, that hasn't yet uh, manifested just because this is a, a new initiative and people are wanting to see whether or not the ERA office is genuine about having whistleblowers come before it, share the information, and then release it to the public, or whether it's just a filtering uh, mechanism to um, like have people come forward, identify who the whistleblowers are, and then just kind of shut up their, their testimonies from the public. And you've ruled out, Michael, that he is any kind of disinformation uh, leak? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, he is uh, someone who I've known all those years, He's given me photos of different craft that he has witnessed over the years. Uh, the, he started sending me photographs around 2015. He sent me well over 100 photographs of various types of craft that he's witnessed. And, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, and his military credentials are rock solid. I mean, uh, I've, I've seen his ID. I've seen his certificates. I've seen the different programs. Uh, that that he's been involved in, and um, he showed me those. And you know, some of those I produced in the book, you know, heavily redacted, so you can't identify the dates or units that he has trained with. But yeah, he's he's the real deal, and he is uh, active U.S. Army. Those photos you sent us are just spectacular. Well, this is one of the things that makes uh, JP's testimony so important because it's not just a because, I mean, there's so many people who do 
have incredible stories that, that, that are out there, but they don't have photographs or video uh, supporting anything that they say that they've experienced. Well, JP does have photos. He's given me some video as well of the, the different craft that he has uh, seen or been taken on. And uh, you know, the, the, the photos I sent you, I mean, those five photos, though, those show some of the craft that he has seen uh, around MacDill Air Force Base um, in 2017. And, and that was a major period. I mean, this is before he joined the military. I mean, uh, he resisted joining the military even though people within the covert military were, sell, were telling him, you know, JP, you should join. And if you join, you'll, you'll get more access. Uh, because there have been times when he was taken uh, by the covert military. So, you know, people would call it a military abduction. So he's been taken on, on he was taken on military abductions before he joined the army. And in one incident, he was taken to this uh, large ocean platform uh, by the covert military. Uh, these were people with the uh, Air Force. And uh, he was taken to this ocean platform in 2015, and they denied him access to what was at the bottom, uh, of what was underneath the platform. And it was only mm. later, after he joined the, uh, the army, that he was allowed access to, to go down into the bottom of this uh, platform, uh, to the bottom of the ocean in the Atlantic, to actually see what was, in fact, a submerged ancient spacecraft. Wow, that, Michael, your insider, JP, gave you some photos of what looked like triangular-shaped UFOs. Is that what I'm looking at? Uh, that's right, yes. Uh, those are the triangle uh, TR3B-like uh, craft that he witnessed and that he photographed. And uh, he, some of these craft he has been in. I mean, uh, these photos were taken in 2017 near MacDill Air Force Base. And, I mean, they were taken in very unusual circumstances uh, because sometimes uh, what happened was that someone would pull up to him in a car or he would receive a phone call saying, look up. And he would look up and he would see these different craft. You know, some were triangle-shaped, some were uh, rectangular-shaped. And you know, one of the photos that I sent you that, uh, uh, that uh, I think you're, you're linked to on Coast to Coast uh, shows uh, one of these uh, triangle craft being shadowed by a helicopter. So this all happened near MacDill Air Force Base. Which is in Tampa, Florida, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And so, and that's the home of Special Operations Command. It's a very large base, and uh, he was uh, encouraged to take these photos and to release them uh, to me. So he had he had been uh, given permission to do so. Well, I mean, he wasn't part of the military at the time, but uh, he was definitely uh, given permission in the sense that they were telling him to take the photos and to release them. So that's, so that's what we did. We released them back in 2017. So these have been in circulation now for, for six years, and they clearly show different types of craft, some of which he has been on. And uh, you know, the things that he saw when he was inside the craft uh, are, are kind of very revealing. But these were, these were military craft, the first four photos in the sequence of five that I sent you, uh, a military craft. And uh, you, you have a tr triangles flying. In one of the photos, you have a triangle flying alongside a rectangle-shaped object. And so this, these are sequences of photos. Like he would send me a sequence of six photos or nine photos, and uh, that, that was what uh, I kind of first reported on. Now, he was, never, he was told not to take video. That's, that was very interesting, that he was allowed, he was encouraged to take photos, but he was told and actually threatened not to take video of the craft. And that, that's very interesting because it showed that, you know, while one faction within the covert world wanted him to take the photos and to release them, another faction that uh, we believe uh, is associated with the CIA uh, wanted to stop it or at least tamp it down in, in saying, okay, uh, you can take photos, but no video. Right. And why 
would they be opposed to him taking videos and possibly releasing it? I think with the videos, uh, taking a video of a craft um, during daylight hours, that is something that can be analyzed and is more compelling in terms of yeah. evidence. Too revealing. Exactly. I think, uh, you know, with the static photos, uh, you know, people can always say, well, that's just a smudge or that's a, a balloon or a drone, and you can dismiss it. Whereas with a video, it's much harder to dismiss that, especially the ones, especially the videos that show, you know, the, the craft being accompanied, you know, this uh, flying triangle being accompanied by a military helicopter. I mean, that's if you have video of that, that would be so much more compelling. But nevertheless, we, you know, we do have photos that, that he sent me of, of that particular incident and other incidents that all happened near McDill Air Force Base. And, and he was saying that one of the covert operatives that he was working with, uh, that they would fly these missions from McDill on these triangles, on these TR-3B-like uh, anti-gravity craft, to different parts of the planet or into space to perform various covert missions, and and that is very that is very telling because that is exactly what Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base does. What did he tell you about inner Earth civilizations, giants, perhaps? Well, he has had various experiences with uh, inner Earth civilizations. Uh, some of these experiences involve him going into uh, very large complexes where he meets with uh, typically human-looking beings. And uh, these beings are often like Nordic-looking, you know, blonde, blue hair, mm -hmm. and, and kind of very long-lived with uh, ancient or advanced technologies. Uh, they, they typically have uh, these very futuristic cities under the ground, or even under the ocean. I mean, he's been there too. But with the underground civilizations, uh, he has performed missions. And these missions to the underground civilizations, uh, they have been mainly after he's joined the military. So while he is active U.S. Army, he was given orders to go to a certain location and he's picked up and then taken on one of these classified missions to this underground civilization, and he sees things and he is told things. So, for example, one of the one of the underground uh, civilizations that he went to, uh, he saw a giant spaceport, and in, in this spaceport, Jeez. he saw hundreds of craft, different types of craft, different uh, shapes of craft, many of them being kind of flying saucer-shaped craft. And uh, he was told that these were craft that belonged to that civilization or to one of the extraterrestrial visitors. So that he is being told that the inner Earth civilizations work very, very closely with extraterrestrial visitors. So that's that's very telling, because even though we on the surface you know, don't acknowledge or. or Officially, it's not acknowledged that extraterrestrials are real. The inner Earth civilizations not only acknowledge that, but they actually work very closely and openly with the visiting extraterrestrials from other planets. Did he ever tell you where they came from? Uh, well, uh, he hasn't been told uh, specifics like uh, names or locate or uh, you know the, the history. That is one of the things that's been very puzzling, why he's not given those specifics. It, it seems as though JP is being allowed to go to these different places, experience these things, but isn't given names. Uh, it's, it's almost like they, they want to kind of like expose him to these different experiences and civilizations and these technologies, but he's uh, never given names or any, any anything specific, so he's not told what uh, extraterrestrial civilization he's interacting with. He's not told whether they come from uh, Sirius or Tau Ceti or the Pleiades. He hasn't told anything like that. He just has these interactions uh, where uh, they might kind of like uh, take him on their on their um, craft, or where he is taken to one of these uh, underground 
civilizations, and he sees things, and then he reports back. How old is he now, do you think, Michael? Uh, he is around uh, close to 40. So he was about 25 when he started talking to you. That's right, yeah. He was in his uh, early 20s, and that was, uh, what, 15 years ago. Pretty dramatic. So he's got a family, and, and uh, you know, we, we don't... I don't divulge details of his family, but you know that's one of the reasons why, you know, we uh, keep keep things confidential. Just because you know, he's on a military salary now, that's how he pays his bills. So we don't want to, uh, you know, do anything to compromise his identity and his um, and his uh, new career. Does he have a rank in the military? He does. Yes. Yes. He's uh, he's enlisted and. Um, he's been serving since 2019, and he uh, continues to go through the the, the regular uh, promotion cycles. So um, he, the current rank he holds is uh, consistent with someone who's been serving in the military for four years. Is he an officer or just enlisted, like you said? I, I can't say that that would be a little too specific, because the, the military does have, uh, for enlisted uh, personnel, uh, either at e, at the E4 or E5, one one uh, becomes a non-commissioned officer. Well, they all know he's talking to you. Uh, essentially, yes. Uh, he did get in trouble with his regular chain of command when they found out that he was talking and sharing information, and uh, he was kind of threatened. Um, because well, who originally gave him the approval to go public? Uh, these were people within the, the covert military. In other words, the the group that he was uh, being assigned to on temporary duty to go perform these missions. I mean, he w- he would have his regular uh, assignment as a, uh, a chemical repairer and ordnance officer, that, that's the, the military occupation specialty that he holds, he would have his regular job, uh, but then he would be called away for these different missions, so he would go on TDY, temporary duty, who would perform the missions, and, and he'd have officers uh, above him telling him what to do, giving him briefings and debriefing him and so forth. And then when he goes back to his regular military assignment, um, he has others, you know, like his uh, sergeants and officers above him, and, and they knew or they found out that he was disclosing this information. And at first, uh, he was getting into trouble because he was being told, uh, why are you doing this by his regular chain of command? But the covert branch was telling him, yes, do this. Keep you doing it. Now, what did the covert branch, why... What was their reasoning for him to disclose stuff? What are they trying to get out to us? I think what they what they realized was that very early on he was a genuine extraterrestrial contactee working with these human-looking groups who had knowledge of advanced technologies. And uh, before he joined the military, he went. He was taken uh, to these different locations where the uh, the human-looking extraterrestrials were working with the U.S. military, and he was told by the extraterrestrials that they have reached agreements with the Air Force in particular uh, to share technologies, and uh, one of the stipulations in the agreement was that uh, JP would be allowed to share uh, his experiences, that he would be able to report on what he was seeing and experiencing. So... This was something that was happening uh, well before he joined the military. This happened before uh, the events at, at McDill Air Force Base where he took the photographs. And, and those photographs, essentially, they're a result of, of earlier agreements reached around 2015 uh, between the, the Nordic extraterrestrials who he has been working with, with uh, the Air Force in particular. And, and those agreements led to him uh, being given this kind of special treatment by the uh, people associated with the, the covert branch of the Air Force, which is uh, Special Operations, uh, U.S. Air Force Special Operations, that they would allow JP or, or encourage JP to take photos because they knew he had this special relationship with these human-looking extraterrestrials. So so this is, this is something that has evolved uh, 
over the over the last fifteen years. In 2017, one of the biggest tropical storms we've ever had, Hurricane Irma, who created $77 billion in damages, hit that region. You think it was created? I I think what happened there, and this was something uh, JP was told as well by the the covert military, was that this was retaliation, that uh, weather modification technologies do exist. We know, we know that historically, uh, you know, you, you have this uh, Secretary uh, Cohen under the uh, Clinton administration uh, in the mid 1990s acknowledged weather modification technology exists. So what happened was that after JP began uh, sharing with me these uh, photos of these flying uh, triangles that were near McDill Air Force Base, uh, that uh, and the covert branch of the Air Force in particular were encouraging him to take these photos, then you have this tropical, well, you have this hurricane, Irma, making a beeline for Tampa. And in, so, in fact, uh, Hurricane Irma, and Irma itself, the, the name stands for, uh, is, is German for war goddess. And uh, this hurricane led to the closure of MacDill Air Force Base and made landfall yes. on, of all dates, September 11 of 2017. And so, and, and, and what JP was told uh, by his uh, Air Force uh, friends at the time was that this was retaliation, that there was a faction associated with the deep state and with the, uh, what I believe was this uh, German breakaway civilization in Antarctica with these advanced uh, mm. uh, weather modification technologies that was steering the hurricane towards Tampa. And it, it did lead, for the first time in its history, to the closure of MacDill Air Force Base. And so, uh, I mean, you, you see in the book, the documentation, that MacDill was closed. Oh, and this, and th- yeah. that closure happened just a uh, you know, less than two weeks after JP first began sharing with me photos of flying triangles near MacDill Air Force Base. It seems to me, Michael, just by chatting with you for the moments we have, that there's a division within this country between groups that want us to know and those that don't. That's right. Uh, George, that has been going on for a long, long time. Um, you can you can go back to one of the early books in this whole UFO field, which is by Donald Kehoe, yeah. uh, called The Flying Saucer Conspiracy. That came out, I think it was 1955. He created NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Oh, Michael, you were mentioning Donald Kehoe, who created NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, years ago. Well, that's right. Yeah, Major Donald Kehoe, I mean, he was the first to really talk at length about this uh, major division. He he called it the silence group, but a group within the military intelligence community at a very high level, senior level, that was against and opposed to disclosure of what was really behind what was called at the time the flying saucer phenomenon. Now now we call it uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena, uh, but essentially the same thing and uh, a, a, a pro-disclosure group that Kehoe was being given information from about the, the nature of the flying sources at the time, which Kehoe knew uh, and was told that this was an extraterrestrial phenomenon. So the same dynamic continues today, and with JP, you have that dynamic where you have some people, uh, very senior people, uh, that are opposed to this information coming out. But there's a, a, another group that wants the information to come out, and they are feeding JP information, uh, getting him to go on various missions where he sees and experiences underground uh, civilizations, uh, submerged sp- spacecraft or space arcs, where he goes off-planet, and to report this to me, and they know that he's, he's telling me all this information and that I'm sharing it, but uh, he is being given that information because there is a group that wants disclosure to come forward. 
Will they get it? Well, uh, this is something that is happening right now. I mean, you, you probably have heard uh, that there was a new whistleblower that just actually came out uh, yesterday in a major story that was uh, reported on this online magazine called The Debrief. And this was about uh, this military whistleblower, uh, David Grush, who was a officer uh, a kind of uh, equivalent of a of a colonel who worked with the Air Force and the mm-hmm. National Reconnaissance Office and the National Geospatial Office, and he says that uh, he saw evidence and spoke with people that were familiar with uh, covert operations to retrieve and exploit recovered extraterrestrial technologies, and 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 that that he was being encouraged to come forward, uh, that he actually had been given permission uh, by uh, an oversight board uh, within the uh, intelligence community, Inspector General's office, to actually share this sensitive information about uh, the data that he had acquired while being a liaison to the, uh, the Arrow office, that's the new UFO office. So he was given approval to come forward. Uh, he uh, is a someone who uh, saw the data. He hasn't been on the missions himself, but he saw the data that these missions were being carried out, and they're very real, and he's been given uh, the authorization to go ahead and to share this with Congress, and, and now he's given a major... Uh, sit-down interview, which is going to come out in a few days, but it was the basis for this story that was released by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal on the debrief. So, uh, yeah, there are very senior-level people that want this information to come out. And, and of course, you know, the, the control group or the silence group, the deep state, whatever you want to call them, I mean, they, they are still there and they are silencing it. Because even within the Arrow office, that's the all-domain uh, all domain anomalous resolution office, uh, you have the director, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who yeah. appeared before a, a, a NASA panel just last week and said there is no evidence that any of these UAPs are associated with extraterrestrial life. Well, according to this new uh, insider, uh, David, uh, he has said that uh, there is actual evidence that these are are exotic technologies that come from uh, not on this planet. And that that is uh, David Grush, who is coming forward with those statements. Have they ever talked about, did JP talk about, the propulsion system? Uh, he has uh, talked a little bit about some of the uh, different ways in which these craft propel themselves. He's, he's talked uh, about the uh, torsion field, which is created by having high-pressured plasma going around in a circular uh, direction. Uh, he he says that he was on one of these craft, uh, one of these uh, TR-3B-like craft, and he was speaking to the pilot who was telling him about the propulsion system. And it was a, a confirmation for what Edgar Fouché had revealed uh, around 1999, I believe, at one of the major uh, contact uh, conferences where he talked about the TR-3B and, and how it... Uh, it operates with this highly pressurized plasma at a very high temperature that circulates around 60,000 revolutions or more. Uh, and, and once you have that plasma m- moving around that quickly in a kind of a circular tube, like a toroid uh, tube, uh, you have this anti-gravity effect, and that reduces the overall weight. And he said it was about uh, 87%. Uh, for the TR-3B at the time, and that was the old model. So the, the newer models of the TR-3B, you know, people have said, well, now, now you have the TR-3-6 or TR-3-7 or 8. I'm not sure how high it goes. But with these newer models, I mean, the anti-gravity propulsion system is much more sophisticated. But according to what JP was told, uh, you know, it does use this kind of torsion effect created by highly pressurized plasma being spun around very quickly. 
We're talking with Dr. Michael Sala, his latest book, U.S. Army Insider Missions. It is book eight of the Secret Space Program series he has written. Let's go to some calls. Let's go to Brenda in Austin, Texas, to get us started. Hi, Brenda. Good morning. Hey, it's Brendan. Oh, <laughs> he's got it as Brenda. <laughs> All right, no worries. Uh, thank you, George, Dr. Sala. Uh, th- and thank you, everyone, praying for my grandmother. You're welcome. Prayer, very much appreciated. Thank you. There you go. Yeah, she's here with me. Uh, she's got to stay up. We're putting eye drops in, so uh, we're hoping for good news on Wednesday. Take care of it. Take care of her. Yeah, and Dr. Sala, thank you for being here tonight. Amazing uh, interview here. Did JP say anything about the moon or Mars, like structures or artifacts or anything else in our solar system? And if not, you ran into the break when you were describing the underwater base. Could you talk more about what was in that? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, JP has been on the moon. Uh, he, he was on a mission to a very large spacecraft, of what he calls a space arc, that uh, was found on the moon. He was part of a team that went inside and investigated it. Uh, one of JP's abilities is that he has this capacity to activate these ancient technologies. So that's one of the things that also is a, a great attraction to the covert military because he can activate these technologies. So it's not just that he's an extraterrestrial contactee himself, that extraterrestrials are supporting and uh, want him to play a role in the disclosure. He's got some kind of genetic consciousness uh, matrix operating whereby he can walk into these ancient structures, whether we're talking spacecraft, arcs, or uh, an- remnants of ancient civilizations, and he activates uh, some of the ancient technologies. As, as far as the moon is concerned, uh, he, he says that uh, he has been told that in the future uh, we won't have a moon, that the, that the moon will actually uh, depart, which is very, very interesting. But the moon definitely has, is, a, is a, actually a spacecraft. It's not a, a natural planetary body. It's an actual artificial device. It was deliberately put here, and it will be one day removed. And I, I assume that will be after the, the kind of planetary disclosures that are, are about to come. And what about these underwater cities? Uh, yes, he was taken to uh, one of these underwater cities. Uh, this was a he was taken there by uh, the inhabitants of this underwater city. He said he was taken there uh, by a kind of submarine anti gravity type device that uh, was actually belonging to this human looking group of very tall uh, nordic looking beings that inhabit this underground city in the Bermuda Triangle. He said that there are three large domes, and each of these domes has within it a city, and the dome itself uh, protects the city, so you, you, you have oxygen uh, inside of the dome, and, and that dome, uh, some kind of shield that protects the city from the incredible pressures of the Atlantic Ocean. And this and, and these uh, complex of three domes and cities underneath them are very close to a ancient space arc that is also located there in the Bermuda Triangle region that uh, JP has been to three times on, on separate missions where he's been inside of the craft. First time caller Donnie's with us now in Maryland. Welcome to the show. Hi, Donnie. Hello, George. A late happy B day. Thank, Dr. thank Shola, you, sir. I have a question about uh, is it a universal rule if unhuman entities interact or face humans, they must tell them first? And is directed energy at weather platforms to create weather change at work as may have happened in America? And may energy have been directed to crystal? in underground caverns in which tornadoes soon occur. Uh, one more thing is, uh, could directed energy, may it have caused 100-plus story skyscrapers to crumble straight down? Take a few of those, Michael. Okay, well, uh, 
far as the question of whether extraterrestrials are obliged to share information about what they're doing, um, you know, there is some occult law which does require if uh, people that are following a kind of service to self path, which we would consider to be a negative path, are about to do something, that uh, they need to uh, tell uh, the victim or the target what they're about to do um, and, and and then they do it and that's some kind of principle, a cult principle that operates. I think that answers that particular question. As for the weather modification, I, I talked about that earlier, that yes, that does, that technology exists. Um, it, it has been used for a long time, for many, for many decades and um, as far as crystals are concerned and weather modification, uh, yeah, I mean, there is, there's a lot of kind of like stories about this ancient Atlantean crystal that is buried in the Bermuda Triangle that is... It's like a weapon or something, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's like a weapon or something, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that it, uh, it's responsible for, you know, weather anomalies there in the Bermuda Triangle, that, you know, craft or ships that are in that area can kind of disappear. We don't know what happens to it. But, yeah, it was apparently a, a weapon that the Atlanteans used, this giant crystal, and that it's uh, submerged there in the uh, Bermuda Triangle. Let's go to Thomas in La Jolla, California. Hey, Tom, welcome. Hi, George and Michael. Thank you for all of the great work that you do. I loved, by the way, Kennedy's last stand. Um, I have a comment and then a question. And my comment, I'm wondering how much disclosure comes through Hollywood. And the reason why I asked that recently, um, I got together with a lady friend, and she had a big screen TV, and we watched two movies back to back. It was 2001 and then 2010. And um, it had been years since, I, since I'd watched both movies. But watching them back to back, I realized how much was revealed in both of those two movies. Um, Peter Hyams, who directed 2010, was a protege of Stanley Kubrick, who directed 2001. But the common denominator was that the script of both movies was Arthur C. Clarke, scientist and speculative writer. And um, how much the themes in both movies, the idea that there's a deep state, the idea that there was assisted evolution of humanity by extraterrestrials, the idea that there was monitoring of humanity and the progress, the idea that there was a deep state collaboration between the United States and the Soviet Union, now the Russian Federation. Um, I guess my question to you is how much disclosure doesn't come to us directly, but comes to us through media like Hollywood? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that a lot of the soft disclosure that is coming through the media is intended to prepare people for this incredible future that is coming. And, I mean, there are many movies, many television series, but the one that I think kind of really stands out for me, um, in addition to 2001, 2010, is, uh, is Star Trek, the Star Trek series that began in the 1960s uh, that has kind of shaped mass public awareness of okay. the whole... Uh, extraterrestrial phenomenon, if that is based, I believe, on actual um, classified disclosures that Gene Roddenberry uh, was, was given uh, by those insiders that were familiar with uh, the real secret space program and interactions with a genuine galactic federation, and that Star Trek is actually based on a future that uh, where humanity is part of a galactic federation, and there's kind of like been a reverse engineering of that future where Roddenberry was given that information and has kind of like disseminated it through his movies and series about a Star Trek future. And, and that term, a Star Trek future, actually has been used and incorporated uh, by the Air Force as a preferred future scenario 
that by 2060, out of eight possible scenarios, a Star Trek future is the one that the Air Force adopted, uh, the Air Force uh, Special Operations uh, Space Command adopted back in 2019. And Air Force uh, Space Command was renamed Space Force. So Space Force is all about creating a Star Trek future, and that's all based on what Roddenberry was told back in the 60s. It's interesting how William Shatner, Captain Kirk, is now hosting a History Channel show called Unexplained. He's into this in a big way. Indeed, he is. Uh, and I, I think uh, you know the, the impact that Star Trek has had on the mass consciousness of the planet is, is very profound. And William, William Shatner... Uh, you know, because of his role in the movies and in the series, uh, really does have, uh, in terms of the global mass awareness, has, does have this tremendous authority. And I'm, I'm not surprised that he's going to be playing, uh, even though I think he's uh, in his 80s by now, I think he's quite uh, advanced in age, I think he, he still has quite a role to play in, this, in these disclosures, which are happening right now. I don't think it's going to take many more years now, uh, George. I think we are witnessing right now with this new witness coming forward, with, uh, that, that is uh, David Grush, uh, that is reporting about uh, what he has seen and has been briefing Congress, uh, JP's revelations, the encouragement he's given by the covert world, that disclosure is happening right now. It so is. Michael, where do people pick up the eighth edition here of U.S. Army Insider Missions? Um, at the moment, it's just available on Amazon in uh, paperback and electronic Kindle edition, and we, we do plan to get an audio book edition out uh, sometime in July. Will there be a book nine of the series? Uh, yes, I'm working on uh, the the second volume, uh, the second edition, uh, well, actually the second volume in this uh, JP's uh, missions, and that will come out probably September, October. Has JP ever been visited by the Men in Black? Uh, he he has been uh, followed. He has been harassed. He's received threatening phone calls, and uh, he has been targeted. Uh, he has. Well, I mean, uh, I don't want to be too dramatic, but uh, yeah, there has been one, at least one attempt to um, <laughs> end his life. And so, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, and he was put in hospital for that. Jeez, but he but he doesn't stop, does he? Uh, no, no, he is fully committed to this to this mission, and uh, he feels that this is his life purpose. And so, yeah, he's very courageous and. To my mind, uh, he is the only current serving office, uh, uh, military uh, person to actually reveal details of these missions involving extraterrestrial life, to, to actually be uh, active and to be talking about this. Uh, he is the only person at the moment that I know of that has, that has been doing this, that is doing this. Ask him if he'd ever come on this program with you. Not using his real name, of course. I, I will talk to him about that. I think he would be very frightened uh, of uh, him being identified. I mean, he is very... You think by his voice somebody could pick up on who he is? Well, uh, it's not so much the voice, um, because he he does interviews. We do interviews, and uh, we, we put him out. Uh, I put it, put it about on my YouTube channel, his updates, but I think uh, going on a high-profile show like Coast to Coast and, and speaking uh, to you and to the general public like that, 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 I think he would be frightened about the consequences for him. So, but I could certainly ask him. Okay. Let's go to Joe, Long Island, New York, to get us started here. Hey, Joseph. Yeah, hi, Michael. Yeah, still got to get your autograph, but... Uh... I have two questions. First would be not so much about the cities, but the possibility of just small facilities being uh, available where somebody could maybe pull up a vehicle uh, just from the surface, go down into these small facilities where there might be uh, a 
other beings or whatever. Uh, is that possible? And also, if these people are human-like, what would tip off uh, the person that they're not quite human? And then my second question is about disturbances with the whales. Uh, there's been a lot of whales washing up in places off New Jersey, for example, very large whales. They think it has something to do with prepping for windmills offshore, with the sonogram being messed up. And what's happening is apparently these whales gobble up these tiny jellyfish massively. And now all of a sudden, without as many whales, this jellyfish is showing up where people can't really swim. It bites them, and uh, they're like the size of a quarter. Uh, but I wonder if it's just that, or it could be uh, an alien presence that would disturb the whales, or would they try and stay away, away from disturbing whales? Well, uh, JP has uh, been on a number of uh, missions to these underground civilizations, and he has been told very similar things, that they are opening up, they are uh, allowing their craft to be seen more, they're sending uh, a lot of these uh, orbs out there to kind of like monitor uh, humanity to interact. They are going to be allowing people to come and visit uh, their facilities, their underground civilization. So they will be uh, more open to kind of like telepathically communicating and meeting with people and taking them to these uh, underground civilizations. That that's that's the plan. Uh, as far as the as far as the whales is concerned, I I believe probably uh, because the whales are so important in kind of maintaining the the, the planetary energy grid uh, in terms of the way uh, we well, what is it we're about seventy percent ocean uh, the world uh, is covered by seventy percent yeah, uh, yeah. by ocean so the whales play a big role in maintaining some kind of a coherent energy grid around the planet. So if, if, if there are those that want to destabilize the planet, uh, they can do so by impacting the whales. And I think that's probably what's happening with their beachings. And I've heard of the, uh, the, the, the jellyfish problem that is growing, and that's probably because, as, as, you, as you said, that uh, the whales are being killed off, and so the jellyfish are just uh, proliferating. Your cover of your book, U.S. Army Insider Missions, is fantastic. It looks like he's on Mars, is he? Uh, yes, it was to depict uh, one of the moons of Jupiter. He's been to Ganymede, um, and he performed uh, uh, a mission to Ganymede where he went to these underground cities and bases, and he interacted with the personnel there, uh, some people that were part of the uh, space uh, the space command and also with extraterrestrials he was uh, describing the culture up there which is one of uh, you know, a lot of camaraderie uh, a lot of people feeling that they're at the kind of like at the tipping edge or at the the crux of this kind of like future that is approaching humanity and uh, he said it was such a privilege and an honor to be, to be serving on Ganymede, even though it was a short period. And, uh, yeah, he got to visit these different facilities. So this, is, this cover is kind of inspired by that, that when he went to Ganymede and uh, was on the surface and uh, went, went underground for uh, visiting these ancient facilities up there. How often do you talk to J.P.? Oh, it's pretty close to uh, a daily basis. Uh, we, you know, communicate by Skype and phone, and uh, yeah, and he he tells me about upcoming missions, and uh, and then sometimes he's not allowed to share with me all of the details of the missions. Like some missions, he says he can't tell me about them, but uh, most of the missions he can share with me. So he said, for example, he's he's got another mission coming up this weekend, so hopefully uh, he'll be able to share that with me and I'll be able to put that out on my YouTube channel. Let's go to Chris in California on the wild card line. Hey, Chris, welcome. Hey, how you doing, gentlemen? Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Sala, does he know anything regarding the X-37B space plane and what its mission might be? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I don't know much more than what the 
uh, what we are told through the, the mainstream media, that it's this craft that can spend up to two years in space. Uh, my guess is that it's uh, using some kind of anti-gravity technology to be able to stay up there uh, for so long and that it's performing some kind of uh, mission, some classified mission in, ver in terms of surveillance. Um, and, and maybe it's, it's kind of like at this, uh, maybe it's a bridging technology between uh, what is commonly used in the secret space programs and what is kind of used in the open source, you know, like the rocket propelled uh, technologies of SpaceX and so forth that this, I think the X-37 is supposed to be some, some kind of bridge between those, those two different worlds and, and, and help that, um, help those two worlds, the, the classified world and the open source world kind of like uh, have a more of a convergence in terms of uh, technologies that are released to the public in terms of energy and propulsion. Does he say that the ETs are benevolent, friendly? Uh, the the only ETs he's interacted with are friendly ones. I mean, that is one of the things uh, that he has described to me, is that uh, they are friendly. Uh, some of them are non-human looking. He's described um, an ant people, uh, a civilization of beings that look like the ant people, that uh, uh, they have these underground bases, uh, cities in under Florida that he's been to, and uh, he's also been to some underground civilizations of these human-looking beings. But they're but they're all friendly. Now that doesn't mean that there are not fr uh, that there aren't a fr uh, unfriendly or aggressive races out there. But the only ones that he's interacted with are the friendly ones. Let's go to Jim, British Columbia, Canada. Hey, Jim, thanks for calling. Hi, George. Thank you very much for taking my call, and a happy belated birthday oh, to you. Oh, thank you. And it's, a, it's a real honor, Dr. Sal, to talk to you. I just wanted to uh, briefly say that uh, I wanted to verify what your whistleblower was saying. I, I had the same thing with a triangle ship that appeared in the wintertime, and they said into my head, as clear as a bell, I was in a rush to come out of the parking lot, and it was minus 25 outside. They said, pull over and stop right now and look at the moon. And I did do that. And I got out of the car with my camera and I saw the perfect clear triangle. And in about seven or eight seconds, it was in a hole in the sky, totally silent, wasn't moving. It was sitting still. And the clouds closed over it just like a drape. But I managed to shoot three pictures of that. And another thing I wanted to verify with you, Dr. Sella, is another. The first set of images your whistleblower came out with was a, a thing that he called a weapons platform. And the same thing that was out in north of here. And, and they said, in my head, shoot straight up, Jim. We're right above you. And I shot into a clear blue sky with my camera. And here was an image that looks exactly what your whistleblower says, the weapons platform. So. I don't know why I'm not, you know, but that's what I got, so. Interesting take. Well, thanks for sharing that, Jim. I, I hope you can uh, send me uh, those photos, contact me uh, by, by email, just to go to my website. But, uh, yeah, that's great that uh, you have had similar experiences and, and have uh, photographs of, of what, you're, what you um, what you saw. So that's very important, and, and thank you for that confirmation. How many years have you been doing this now, Michael? Um, I've been doing this uh, since 2001. I mean, I saw doc, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project press conference in Washington, D.C. I, I, I saw the video recording of it, uh, and uh, and I was hooked from May of uh, 2001. I was hooked and and still am hooked. I mean, I still get very excited to find out what do. the what the next breaking development in this uh, UFO phenomenon is. So, yeah, I definitely found my calling, and... Um, after 22 years now, I'm, I'm still very enthused and looking forward to another 22 years. I remember when you were on the air with me back in the 2003 or four, and you were talking about if you continued doing what you were doing, you weren't going to be at the American University too much longer. Remember that? I certainly do. Yeah, I, I, that was. I think you were one of the first. Uh, uh, interviews I, I did, and I was working at the university at the time, and uh, unfortunately, because I got a bit too much exposure, uh, the Washington Post ran a, a feature story 
on some of my research, uh, the university cut all its ties with me. And, uh, yeah, that was a very uh, kind of like emotionally draining experience to go through. But I'm very thankful for the support you gave me and the coast-to-coast -coast audience Absolutely. support. Does JP talk about spirituality, about God? Does it come up at all? It's a very important aspect of his life. He doesn't talk about it too much, but I know he does pray. He is a, a, a very devout, um, a, let's say a, a Christian, um, and, he, and he does communicate with uh, beings that he feels are part of that kind of Christian hierarchy. And he, and he feels that they, those, uh, those beings uh, protect him. And uh, so, yeah, he he's definitely has a very deep religious, spiritual connection. But, but uh, yeah, he doesn't kind of like advertise it too much because he, he, he feels that it's important for people to find their own spiritual path. But he does emphasize that it is important to find a spiritual path. And I agree wholeheartedly with that, that uh, you can't face this phenomenon uh, on, on your own without having a very deep spiritual grounding in something that um, yeah, helps you better understand the significance of it all. What is the main thing that you would like people to get with U.S. Army Insider Missions? I, I think to just appreciate that this is someone uh, that is being supported by people, officers, senior officers in the military who themselves feel threatened and cannot come out and say it, but they are encouraging and giving protection and support to uh, subordinates like JP to be able to come forward and, and reveal the truth and that soon the officers uh, will be allowed to do this. But for now, JP is kind of like a, a test. He's a, they're trying to see how impactful he can be, but he's a kind of lowly uh, enlisted personnel uh, and uh, they are encouraging him to do this. I bet they're listening to you tonight. Michael, thank you so much. Dr. Michael Sala, his book, U.S. Army Insider Missions. It is number eight of his Secret Space Program series. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.